Have a seat, everybody. Even those folks out there. Hey, guys. Welcome. Welcome, everybody, to Organic Sound Select Guitars. Uh, God, I'm so thrilled that you guys are all here. I, I was just telling everybody, we were, you know, we were scared that we would have six people show up for this event. I'd have these great speakers here, and, and James and Richard, and, and we've got a full house, and uh, I'm very honored and thrilled that you're all here. So thank you so much for coming and helping support us and listening to what these guys have to say and play. We're excited to have them. My name is Larry Sogolo. For those who don't know me or haven't met me yet, my wife Debbie is right here in the white shirt. We own the place. We are excited uh, to, to be open and running. Just to introduce the rest of the family, Ben, Sarah. We're a family business, and, uh, and uh, we couldn't have done it without their input and their help. And I certainly couldn't be here without um, my wife's support. So I know that's rare to have a guy my age say, I want to open a guitar shop and have a wife that says, sure, let's do it. <laughs> you know, so we did it, and we're here, and, and it's a lot of fun, and we're, we're, we're embracing it. <laughs> so another a couple of announcements. We have decided we want to do something good for the world besides providing a local guitar shop, which is a good thing for the world. But we want to uh, donate some money. So for the month of November, we've decided we're going to donate 5% uh, of all sales to an organization called Sunflower Guitar for Ukraine. And the story there is Linda Manzer, right, um, who is a wonderful luthier, built a guitar at the start of the Ukraine war. And it's got a sunflower inlay on the headstock, and it's blue and yellow, the colors of Ukraine. And the guitar has been making its uh, tour of North America, being photographed with some very famous musicians and a lot of builders and luthiers. I know Richard has a picture with it as well. Um, but if you look on the website, you'll see James Taylor and Pat Metheny and, and uh, Vince, Vince Gill and... Uh, who am I leaving out? A lot of, lot of folks. Julian Lodge uh, has a video with it that's just wonderful playing, just exquisite playing. So, And what they're doing is they're raising money, and all the money they raise is going to go towards uh, families who have been affected by the war in, in Ukraine. So, you know, it's, it's a good thing to do for the world, and we want to we help contribute. So if you want to buy something, you're, doing, you're not just giving us money, which helps to support a local guitar shop, which is appreciated, but it's also to do something good for the world. So that's for the whole month of November. So to introduce our guests, I know that, that James is going to play a little bit first. I'll introduce him first. Um, James and I just met an hour or two ago. I already feel like he's a friend of mine. Um, we've been communicating some over the last few weeks, but he's a, a super nice guy, and not only that, but a phenomenally talented and gifted musician. Um, he's well known for his work with his band, The Waybacks, as well as some other bands, The... I love the, the name, the Nash Villains. Oh, okay. okay. <laughs> and also has a lot of solo work and as band leader, um, instructional videos, and not for, I don't know how it feels about me telling this, but not for nothing, he was named by Guitar Player Magazine as one of the top 50 acoustic guitar players of all time. So oh, where you guys are going to find out how good this guy is <laughs> in a minute. And uh, I'll introduce Richard also. You guys all know Richard. This is Richard Hoover. He's the founder and owner of the Santa Cruz Guitar Company. And he started the company in 1976, was it, or uh, five? Our official beginning is 1976. 1976. Yeah, 46th anniversary. 46 years. Um, and wow. wow. Yeah. So Richard has really dedicated his career to advancing uh, both the art and the science of fine guitar building. Um, I think he does it better than anybody else anywhere. Um, I'm very honored that we as a store are part of the Santa Cruz family now. Um, it, it makes me very happy because really Santa Cruz guitars is what brought me into the whole idea of, of selling fine guitars. I love them. Um, we've got some great ones in the shop here. And uh, I love the company top to bottom and I think that's 
because of Richard's example and, and his dedication and his passion for, for what he does. So um, please, folks, let's just give a warm welcome to Mr. James Nash and Mr. Richard Hoover. Com. And uh, it is an extremely noble pursuit. Linda had the uh, inspiration. Um, uh, really, a reaction to the horrible news of what's going on in Ukraine and a feeling of helplessness and a desire to do something for uh, the cause. And she did what she does best. She started building a guitar. But she realized the limitations of her network and the one guitar and uh, how is that going to help. And there's a couple of spectacular, um, uh, I say spectacular people that are known for paying forward. Uh, one is uh, uh, St. Joe Glazer in Nashville, one of the world's best uh, guitar technicians, who's a confidant to every classic rock Nashville star in the world. And Fred uh, Walecki from Westwood Music here. And between the two of them, they connected her with just about every celebrity that ever existed uh, that signed the case, contributed to the guitar, and got the noise going on this. So the website will explain much better where these proceeds go and what they're going to do. But for all of us that feel, again, the same way Linda did, helpless in the face of this, what can we do? It's a real good place to focus your attention. So we can look it up and announce that. Yeah, okay, good. Sunflowerguitar.com. Uh, and I, I want to introduce my dear friend uh, James Nash and take advantage of his presence, uh, you know, to promote what we do with artists. Um, our artist relationship program is quite simply my relationship with artists. <laughs> we, we don't have uh, contracts. We don't do... Uh, uh, anything uh, we don't there's not one standard thing we do with artists it depends on uh, the artists themselves so everybody that we work with we promote or do a signature model is the product of being introduced to somebody looking for a custom guitar and then that custom instrument has a, a broad enough appeal that uh, we want to introduce it to the world and go there so James is a beautiful example of what our deal is is we want to do whatever we can to amplify each other's successes and uh, make the world a better place through music. So we, we've we been at this a long time, right? And uh, uh, James's guitar is really special to me, special to him, and uh, uh, it's uh, it does exactly what we set out to do here. Um, I'll weave this into my narrative here, but uh, uh, guitar making is, is, is a beautiful vehicle for what we do, but it is a vehicle. Uh, my shameless uh, pursuit here is making the world a better place, uh, improving quality of life um, uh, for not only us, but our customers and everybody else. Music's a universal language, and it speaks across politics, frontiers, uh, races, sexes. Uh, uh, music is a beautiful thing, and the more of it we make, the better we are, and uh, these guitars are our contribution to that. So would you please play some music, oh, and I'll shut up, and then we'll hear about your guitar. Yeah, thank so, you, Richard. Great. Thanks and for coming. It is a pleasure to share a stage with Richard Hoover. It's a pleasure to share a cup of coffee or just a phone call with this man. I have known you since I was... 18 years old, and I will tell the, that story I'm in a second about that and, and my guitar, but I also just really want to thank Larry for, for inviting me down. It's really an honor to be part of this. It's such a beautiful shop. He was talking, I asked him, how did you find such a beautiful space to hold your guitar? And of course, it's, he made it a beautiful space. I don't think this place looked very nice when you, uh, when you found it. Um, and, and it's just, it, this is a really special place, and just a local guitar shop, you know, in a, in a world where our commerce is more and more just done in a very detached way where everything is shipped to us, everything is selected online. There are, there are things that you just need to see and touch and play and like, 
smell to really appreciate and and to get to do that with you know local dealers who really understand what you're looking for and know what guitars are capable of doing and know what these different companies can do it can be such a great relationship so thank you all for supporting a local guitar store because this is really what makes this whole industry work so thank you larry i'll play just for a second here and uh kind of make this up, but this just seemed like kind of what, I don't know, I looked around and this just kind of feels appropriate. So let me see. Thank you very much. So this guitar I'm playing is OM number 105. And really it, like all things with time, to me it's kind of paradoxical because when I think about this being OM 105, on the one hand, I can't believe that it's that early as Santa Cruz when you look at the serial numbers, which are, they're all sequential, right? So mm -hmm. each, the, if you've got, if you have number 5001, then it's 
one more than 5,000. This is 105. But I also kind of have trouble imagining that when I got this guitar, you had already built a hundred of these things. <laughs> if I could, the, they're sequential by the body size. So we'd made 105 OMs to that point. Right. Dreadnoughts would be a different scale, and that's totally boring. So back to you. Well, at that time, so in, but that, that I don't find that boring at all. So in 1990, you had made 105 OMs. Was that your most common model then, or not? Uh, not at all. Um, the Dreadnought, uh, you know, when I, I, I came of age playing guitar, the Dreadnought was the only thing that a grown-up would play. You know, an OM was something for a maiden aunt, a retired music teacher, or something like that. Martin didn't even have it in their catalog. Uh, and, it, and when it first came out, it was a huge guitar. That's the orchestra model. So the Dreadnought was a real anomaly. And we've kind of gotten a little more sophisticated in our playing and moved beyond that big bass heavy boomy thing. And today, OM, double O, triple O are the most popular guitars. Really interesting, yeah. yeah. We've come to our senses. I, th I think so. Oh my gosh, I, I read it. There was a Martin guitar catalog from about 1930 that listed all of their models. And you know, the. It, most of us are all familiar with, you know, a triple O is bigger than a double O, which is bigger than a single O, but then if you know the Martin guitars, they get into the higher numbers, which are either smaller, so there's a Model 1, which is smaller, and there's a Model 2, which is smaller than that, and Martin, <laughs> Martin very carefully, knowing that they had so many models, they listed them in 1930 with a suggested, like you said, a Dreadnought would be a man's guitar, that, and it was very right. clearly yeah. the Dreadnought, <laughs> and, and I loved it, they listed that the Model 2 was for students and ladies. So I agree, we've come a long we've come way. A ways, we've yeah. come a long way in, in the way we look at music. Um, so I, uh, my father has always been very supportive of, of my music and I really can't thank him enough for that um, ever since I was a kid. And uh, he had some nice guitars around the house. He had a, a Martin D28 and he had a Gibson J185 that I got to play when I was in high school. And then when I went off to college, the only guitar that was really mine was a Fender Stratocaster. And I took that off to, to uh, college with me. And I didn't have any acoustic guitars. And I very quickly realized that acoustic guitar was a lot more practical and fun to walk around people's rooms and play and stuff. So I was just borrowing acoustic guitars. And my, I told my dad about this. And he started hatching this plan in his head that when he came out to visit me, he was going to give me a guitar as a present. Um, and he went into corner music in, uh, uh, in Nashville, Tennessee, and uh, I think uh, Eric Clapton had just done the Unplugged performance, so OMs mm -hmm. are really popular. So he thought, well, this OM looks like a good guitar, so he asked for an OM, and they gave him a Martin OM, and he was playing it. And uh, I shouldn't have said the brand name because I love Martin guitars, but he also, after my dad was playing it for a little bit, he said, you should try this other guitar. And he had this guitar on the wall, and it was used. It was like... A year old. Somebody bought this guitar and didn't like it. I don't know who that is. I'd really be fascinated. Their taste was all in their mouth. I know, exactly. And so he handed it to my dad and told him, you know, you'll play this. Now my dad, you've got to know, my dad probably knows four chords on the guitar. Um, but he absolutely knew enough to say, wow, this I do like this guitar better. And so he bought this guitar used in corner music in 1991 um, and brought it out to school and gave it to me as a surprise gift. Um, and I was in a band and immediately took it into a recording studio and made sort of the first real record of my life uh, at the time. Um, but there was a problem with this guitar. I think it had been kind of abused. Maybe it was left out in the sun or in, in, in the bathroom or who knows. But the neck was twisted a little bit. And no matter how you adjusted the truss rod, it wouldn't. And I messed with it and I tried different string gauges. And so I... I was in Palo Alto, so it was not that hard for me to borrow a friend's car and drive down and meet Richard. And um, Richard was the most generous kind. I mean, every bit of what you see up here on stage is just what this man is all about. He is just kind and, and supportive and is trying to make the world a better place. And so here I am, this 18-year-old kid with no money and no record contract and no nothing. It's not like I came in and said, hey, Richard, I'm going to sell millions of guitars for you. It's kind of like, Richard, I need help with this instrument. And you said, you, you messed with it and you messed with it and you said, I need to keep it. And so I left it with him, and about a week later, you called me up and you said, this neck is just all wrong, I'm building you a new one. 
and so he did. So he built a brand new. So this is not the original neck on the guitar. It's a mahogany. This is a standard OM. It's a, a Indian rosewood back and sides and a Sitka top, um, ebony fingerboard, and it has the the uh, logo inlaid at the 12th fret, which is what they, it was their standard location. I don't think that's standard now. Is a custom order for that now? Um, yeah. Indeed. Oh, there's no interesting story there. Just responding to market, market yeah, yeah, demand. Yeah. yeah. Plus, uh, people read this as saga, which didn't serve our purposes at all. And see, so, I always thought it was a dragon. It looks like a um, dragon to me. It, it, you know, what's nice is that's good. It can be whatever you want it that's to right, be. That's right. That's right. It's yeah. a Rorschach. But, yeah. but, but so Richard put a brand new neck on this guitar, um, and it's been wonderful ever since. It is a, a thinner neck than is, I think, sort of typical on a guitar. And I think a lot of their necks are a little bit thicker than this. I think the reason you did this neck was because I told you I liked the neck that was on it, and you mm -hmm. just made it the same. Um, but this neck has not ever been reset. It's a 1990 model. And I have traveled, I have, I don't even know how many hundreds of thousands of miles I have put on this guitar. Um, the original case, I, I, okay, I just moved. <laughs> this is how much of a packer I I have the original case for this guitar. It's in my garage. It's, it's beat up and cracked. It's a cheap, you didn't use very great, good cases back in 1990. <laughs> um, and I toured with it in a van for a while, but I've kept it because I couldn't bring it to myself to throw away. I think I might throw it away because we're moving and we need space. But, um, but I, it's been through many cases. It's been checked. I mean, I've probably sadly handed this over to at least 200 times to airline baggage handlers um, in a Colton case. And uh, it's probably been dropped. I have no idea how many times. And uh, so it's, it also weighs, what, like three pounds or something? I mean, it's extremely light, like all their guitars are. It's just it's a fine-built instrument. And I think it's a really good, Richard and I talk about this a lot, it's a really good example of the difference between something being delicate and something being fragile. And, and this instrument is absolutely, it's a delicate musical instrument. I mean, it is, it is hand-built, it is, it is beautiful, but I've taken it out on stage in Colorado when it was 110 degrees and 0% humidity, and I've played it on a stage where it was raining sideways, and Don't I was trying try to keep this the guitar home. drive. I know. <laughs> and just because that's what you have to do if you're going to be a performing musician, and they, you can see the top finish is all crazed up, and even the worst thing I did, this is cautionary tale, so when, I don't have my strap here, but if you put a guitar on a strap, um, a lot of time you don't quite get the strap on there right. And that's not really a problem because as long as you're smart and you keep the instrument and you're holding it, if it falls, you're going to catch it. But what you really don't want to do is say if you're backstage like in Utah and you start talking to somebody on a concrete floor and you take your hands off your guitar to articulate a point and your strap is on and this guitar went, ouch, boom, and it bounced up about six inches and I managed to catch it before it fell again. And I looked, and I thought, well, and it was almost in tune, and I tuned it up, and I, and I played three more dates on that tour, and then I flew home. And what I realized in the hotel that night was that you could slip a s sheet of paper in between the side and the back of the oh, guitar. Yeah. Well, you know this, because I brought it oh, to yeah. you. I mean, of course. Like, this is what you do when you have a Santa Cruz guitar. If you have a problem with it, you call Mr. Richard Hoover, and you know he can fix anything, and he did. So. He, he re-glued the, the top, and you, can, you, you can't tell, and the instrument is fine. So it's, it's really amazing to me that I, 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 my, my whole musical existence and life feel like they are tied up in this guitar. It's been with me everywhere. It's been with me most of my life. Um, and I really could not think of an instrument that I would more rather just have be part of me. So it's just, it's, it's, this, it's, it's a wonderful instrument, and they're just, he's a, he's a great, he's, he's just a, He's a leader in this field and just really a kind soul. And, uh, and so it's, it's a pleasure being part of this company. <sighs> oh, yeah. I guess Larry asked how much the new neck cost um, when I was 18 and didn't have any money. Richard just gave it back to me, no charge. Yeah. yeah. So I mean, there are companies that will talk about, oh, warranty this and lifetime that and whatever. But my experience with Santa Cruz guitars is they want their guitars to be right. And if a guitar, I think that's why he did it. It wasn't because Richard felt like, okay, I see money in this kid. He's going to go out and make, <laughs> get on stage. I think, I, I mean, correct me if I'm wrong, but I think you just didn't want your name on a guitar that had a problem. Maybe I'm wrong. 
Um, you know, these decisions for me are actually pretty easy because I don't try to do this alone. Um, uh, sometimes I got to take a quiet time and uh, uh, turn to my higher power and uh, get direction on it. In your case, it was the right thing to do, and I felt it at the time, and uh, uh, it's paid off not in uh, monetary rewards in your career, although that's been great, but the depth of our friendship and what we can do together in amplifying each other's stuff. Um, if, you, if you think that I'm that guy uh, that gives away the farm, uh, Close to the same year, I turned down two other about 18-year-olds that um, their, their approach, their uh, 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 presentation just didn't seem right for us. Um, people you'll never hear of again, um, uh, Joe Bonamassa <laughs> and Keith Urban. <laughs> I, I told them both... Uh, uh, I think maybe Julian Lodge was one of these two. I said, you know, when you get a cassette together of your work uh, and some uh, your press kit pre-internet, come on back. We'll talk about this. So, yeah, it uh, is a good thing. It's a beautiful thing, and that's a real heartwarming testimonial. Thank you. Um, I, uh, uh, as I said, I got into guitar making. Um, not to start a business, uh, I got into it because you know I was called to do this, and I felt that was the vehicle where I could really uh, affect some world change, uh, meet my goals, do what I wanted to do, and the um, uh, the nature of our relationships with artists are relationships, as I explained, and they've been extremely beneficial. In fact, most the the biggest names that we work with probably have financial endorsements with big companies. You know, they'll get several guitars a year. Uh, some companies have a level of fam famosity, right? At a, if you, you get these sales, you get this many free guitars, we pay you this much, et cetera, et cetera. But the people that uh, have those uh, use our guitars where it counts, you know, in recording and things like that where it's the sound. And they're all products of custom guitars. So here's a really good place to bring this around today. First, I want to thank um, Larry and Debbie for the spectacular thing they've done here. You walk into this store, and it's not their decor, their choices of colors. You know this is a business with a heart. And that is the kind of people that we choose to do business with. In fact, life's too short to do business with mean people. Um, we are at a size where we can be uh, particular about who we work with. And their presentation, the heart that they put into us, we knew this was the right place for us. And uh, 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 life has not always been good. There's been some very hard times over the last 46 years in uh, demand for guitars. And there's been times where we had to make make standard models, sell to bigger stores. Um, a quick anecdote, there was a store whose middle name was Guitar Center. And, <laughs> and I went to uh, do a workshop with them in North Hollywood. And they had, oh, I think about seven of their staff that would represent the guitar. And I gave a story very much I'm going to talk to you about today. And we took a break to have coffee and use the restroom. And we, re we readjourned uh, or reconvened. And there was only half as many people. And I asked, what, did the other uh, salespeople have to go back to work? And they said, no, we have a lot of turnover. <laughs> <laughs> so as, as you'll learn here, um, what we're doing in guitars is not an easy thing to market. It's a bit of a complex story. And uh, for a company like Guitar Center, our most big retailers, um, uh, they don't sell a guitar on sound, feel, vibe. Uh, they're counting on the marketing of the big company to have sold that guitar before somebody walks in. I, had a, uh, I have a really great relationship with some of the big uh, uh, international mass producers like Yamaha, Takamini, etc. And I was, I was showing a guy representing the company how to voice and tune a guitar top, really the uh, secrets of uh, Stradivarius, uh, the real violin tradition. And he was engaged, he was interested, and he finally said, I'm really glad we don't have to do this. <laughs> and I said, wouldn't you like to make your guitars more consistent and sound better? And he goes, mm, we don't have to. Uh, he said, we sell a million guitars a year, and we can't count on somebody coming in and playing it and liking it. We have to sell it to them before they even walk in the store, right? Uh, lifestyle Association, uh, you know, uh, the pretty counterpart on the beach with friends that love you because you're playing this brand and model. That's how we sell guitars. Well, I, right? if, if, if I can interrupt, too. That, Please. That, 
that's remarkable that they wouldn't want to take that knowledge mm -hmm. and use it, but I think it's also really remarkable the way you share that sort of knowledge with the industry um, and would help other companies, which I think some people might look as competitive and hurting your own sales. If you help another company make better guitars, then ours won't be as good relative or something. And you just, I don't think you ever think about that. Well, most of our economy is set up on that, that paradigm that uh, you want to one-up your competition. But the truth is, um, uh, I had two, two really important mentors in my early, early career. Uh, James Patterson, who wrote the book on Pearl Inlay, you can still get from Stu McDonald, and Bruce McGuire, who co-authored uh, Classical Guitar Making with Art Overholzer. Beautiful men, and both of them, when I asked them independently, you know, what can I do in exchange for you show me how to make guitars, you know, uh, paint your fence, build a barn, wash your car, every day and both of them said independently no you can do what we've done for you in the same spirit for others which means you know help people out when they ask and, and go for it and bruce put it even more succinctly he said he said what I, what I want you to remember from me is to do your best share with others in the same spirit i've shared with you he says um it works every time you'll get more than you give. And that's the foundation of Santa Cruz Guitar Company. And after uh, 46 years of this, it's not a young man's idealism, it works. And uh, our, our sharing of our information with others uh, has inspired other people. We're part of a group that really changed the paradigm in Europe of the guild system, where uh, uh, one person passed the knowledge to another in a linear progression, kept secrets, and that has its limits. And when they saw what we were doing here and the level of guitars rising, uh, they wanted to get in on the game too. And today we find sharing, I'm gonna say this, broad statement, uh, most anybody that's confident in what they'll do will share their information with other builders. The people that have secrets, we might not ever hear from them again, right? They live in their own world and that's pretty much where they'll stay. Uh, the basics are, there's not a lot of things you could keep secret in an acoustic guitar. It comes down to doing the work, uh, putting in the time, and, and having you know, respect for your customer. So having said that, I'm not here to promote a brand of guitars. I'm here to explain to you more thoroughly how guitars work so you can make your choices. And cheap guitars are a beautiful thing. I'm a really big fan of cheap guitars. The, the, the least expensive, quickest made instrument, uh, can, uh, you can write a song and change the world. You can attract a mate for life. Um, uh, you really can affect change. Uh, they, they're made quickly, they're affordable, people all over the world can get them. Um, what we're doing is taking that to another extreme. We're making the best sounding and playing guitar possible so there's no limits to your creativity. When you want to express yourself, write that song to change the world, uh, you're going to be inspired by the sound and the ease of playing. So I'm going I'm to spend a lot of time explaining to you today how you achieve that. We're not better in what we do, but we do, we go further, we make something different that you can't find uh, uh, in, in, you know, in a regular shopping for instruments.